Friends, welcome to worship for Sunday, March 27, 2022, the fourth Sunday of Lent. It's trying to be spring, I think, but Wisconsin doesn't like to give up on one winter too easily. We're having one of those weeks where one day it's glorious and you can imagine planting a garden and going to a baseball game and the next day is filled with snow and sleet and fog and who knows what else. But spring is surely coming. The migrating birds are returning and I've heard that there are already swans near the Navarino Nature Center. The changing seasons are a reminder for us, even during this season of Lent, that God, life, and love will always have the final word. Even in the most challenging of times, God is with us, working for the good of us and of all creation. Speaking of challenging times, the war in Ukraine continues now in its fifth week. As I record this on Saturday, President Biden and other leaders of NATO countries are meeting. Russian bombing of civilian sites continues and there is increasing evidence that they may be using white phosphorus bombs as well as other weapons intended to set fires and cause additional destruction. Refugees continue to flee the country while many Ukrainians are staying to defend their nation's sovereignty. As that war slogs on, with no clear way to end it in sight, war continues in Syria, Yemen, and Palestine. But there is a tentative peace in Ethiopia's Tigray state. The Rohingya people of Myanmar, formerly Burma, continue to struggle for freedom, as do the Uyghur people in China. Closer to home, severe weather has caused destruction in the southern United States, with several tornadoes touching down in Texas and other places, including one in New Orleans, Louisiana. Rising prices, even as prices at the gas pump have dropped, along with the ending of some of the pandemic-related systems of social and financial support, including funding for school meal programs, means that more of our neighbors are struggling to make ends meet. And there's news about increasing warming of the planet, temperatures higher than they've ever been at both the North and South Poles, along with the glaciers melting and ice sheets breaking up in Antarctica. And there's news of the subvariant of the Omicron strain of COVID that is causing rising hospitalization rates in many places, including Hong Kong, China, and parts of Europe. The variant has been detected as near as Chicago, and it's likely not going to be long before it gets closer. We don't need to panic, but we do need to be paying attention. I am monitoring infection rates in our area, Brown County, Outagamie County, and Shawano County. And right now, we're still in good shape. We have to be as we have been in these past years, faithful and flexible. We can meet this challenge working together to protect our own personal and collective health. But this is all a lot because I haven't even touched on the more personal struggles in our lives, our friends who are struggling, family members in need of hope and healing, the challenges of our local communities, the exhaustion of two years of pandemic living that also brought social upheaval and election, the January 6th terrorism, and so much more. So now, even before worship begins, I'd like to invite you, if you're comfortable doing so, to close your eyes. Take a few breaths as deeply and slowly as you can, allowing your body to rest in God's loving arms of grace. Feel that breath moving through you. The spirit of God that moved over the waters at the beginning of creation. Feel the breath filling your body, every cell and fiber of your being, reminding you that you are created in God's very image, just the way you are in this moment. Feel that breath bringing life and energy to your brain, your heart, your soul and opening you to what God needs you to hear and to do and to be today and in the days to come. Now, if they're closed, I invite you to open your eyes. This practice of slowing down to breathe, to think of God's spirit moving through us, won't make any of the problems go away, but it might just give us the strength to face them to meet the challenges of our day with clearer heads and hearts. And now a few parish announcements. 
we continue to receive a special offering to help with relief work in Ukraine. Working with the Reformed Church of Hungary, we will get funds to the people on the ground most in need. You can make checks out to your church and list Ukraine aid in the memo line. There are lots of ways people are collecting and sending relief to refugees and others in need. And this is the one we feel most confident will have direct effect, ensuring funds go where they are most needed. We are also looking forward to Holy Week and Easter. The schedule is as follows. Palm Sunday is April 10th. Worship is at the usual times at all three churches, remembering Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Monday, Thursday, April 14th, worship is at Black Creek at 7 p.m., remembering the Last Supper. Holy Friday, April 15th, worship is at Trinity at 7 p.m., remembering Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion. Holy Saturday, April 16th, at Cecil with food and fellowship at 4 p.m. and worship at 5 p.m. Easter Sunday, April 17th at Trinity with worship at 7.45 a.m. and Easter breakfast to follow. And at Black Creek with Easter breakfast at 8.30 a.m. and worship at 10.15 a.m. There will be a special collection, excuse me, a special edition of this worship for Monday, Thursday, Holy Friday, and of course Easter weekend as well. We are also looking for your Easter flower dedications for plants and flowers you might bring to our sanctuaries. There were dedication forms in the March newsletter, and there'll be another one in the April newsletter out next week. And as always, remember that I am here for you and with you, and that together with God we can face anything that the future will bring. And now, bring yourself to a spirit of worship. Let us pray. We come today to witness to Jesus' presence among us. We gather to hear the story of Jesus' power to change lives. We offer ourselves to Jesus' work in the world. We worship together in thanksgiving and hope. Our first hymn, O God, How We Have Wandered, is one of my favorite Lenten hymns, reminding us that we have tried to hide from God's love and that God is relentless in searching for us, reaching out to us, and offering us the blessings of pardon and peace. Let us pray, remembering the Spirit is always with us. 
Holy God, during this season of Lent, help us to focus our hearts, our minds, and our lives on the promise of your kingdom. Remind us that the kingdom is not just for us, but in your generosity is a gift for all creation. Stir us up and unsettle us with your incredible grace. Comfort us and bring us peace with your calming spirit. In all we do and in all we are, remind us of your love so much greater than we can begin to imagine. In hope and faith we pray, amen. And now we join our hearts and minds together in prayer deepening and strengthening the ties that make us Christ's community, uniting ourselves with Christians throughout time and across the world. Let us pray. God of all our lives, we come today thankful for all the ways in which you bless us. You provide us with friends and family, with community and our parish, and through them all, you enrich and nourish our souls. Sometimes, in small and often overlooked ways, you reveal to us each day the glories of your love. We thank you for all that is good and gracious in our lives, particularly for our congregations and our parish that help us to remember we are not alone in this journey of discipleship. We praise you for the strength, faithfulness, and flexibility of our parish as we practice our faith working to be people who welcome all in your name, sharing your love with our words and our actions. Help us to see the world with your eyes, with eyes of love and kindness, and help us to remember that we are bound together as your children and your beloved creation. Be with all those who stand in harm's way in our name, soldiers, sailors, firefighters, police officers, and first responders. Keep them safe as they do their work, and be with all who have served. Be with those who provide the goods and services on which we depend, those whose work is so often unseen and taken for granted. Help us to be truly grateful for them and to share our gratitude more clearly. Be with our medical professionals and facilities as they continue to work to provide for all of our health needs. Give them the strength and courage they need for these days. Help us to do our part to lessen their burdens and remind them that we are with them in prayer. Be with all who are in government on any level, those entrusted with the sacred work of leading our communities and our world. Inspire them to do what is just and what is right for all your children and for all creation. Encourage and inspire our teachers and students administrators and aides and all of their families. These are overwhelming days, O oh God, and so many of our educators are worn out by the challenges of this time. Give them all that they need to learn and grow together. Remind them that we are with them in prayer and help us through their tireless efforts to have strong communities. Help us to open our hearts to all who are seeking places to live in safety and hope. Be with those who are now refugees from Ukraine and from everywhere, those who have left behind their homes and are seeking a new life here in the United States and around the world. Help us to be kind and compassionate towards all. Be with, O oh God, all those who struggle in body, mind, or spirit, particularly those recovering from surgery and hospitalization, those dealing with the challenges of cancer and its treatments, those who are struggling with their mental health and the difficulties of receiving help, those who struggle with addiction, those who are living with COVID and its long-term effects, and all those in need of your healing. Grant to all your grace and love and remind all who struggle that we are with them. Be with everyone who is overwhelmed by this time in the life of the world. In the uncertainty of these days, help us to trust that you are with us, encouraging us, giving us all we need for this moment and whatever lies ahead. Strengthen and comfort all who grieve, whether that loss is new or many years old, and help us to trust in your promise through Jesus of life everlasting. 
Be with all the places in this world you love so much that are dealing with natural disasters and the places dealing with violence, war, and disease. Be with the people of Ukraine caught in the middle of war, those fighting for their country's sovereignty, those who are fleeing and taking refuge in other countries, those who are separated from their families to keep them safe, and those who have no way of leaving the conflict. Be with all, including Russian soldiers and the Russian people who are caught in a madness not of their own making. Be with the southern United States, including Texas and Louisiana, after recent tornadoes and strong storms. Be with all the places where disasters have shattered and upended lives. Be with Syria, Ethiopia, Yemen, and Madagascar, and everywhere that famine and hunger are destroying lives. Be with Burkina Faso, the Congo, Afghanistan, Haiti, Tunisia, Myanmar, Yemen, Tigray, the Sudan, the Uyghur people, the Rohingya people, Palestine, and Israel, and all the places where your people struggle for freedom and for peace. Be with the families of the missing and murdered indigenous women across this country. Be with all who are victims of violence, sexism, racism, and all the interconnected isms that cause hatred and discrimination. Help us to be honest about our shared history, particularly the history of slavery and residential schools, learning about it and working towards a new world. Inspire us and give us hope that we might work with you to create a new way forward, a path that honors the dignity of all people, that recognizes your presence in all people and in all creation. Renew our hope, strengthen our faith, deepen our patience, and inspire our hearts, O God. Give us all we need for whatever lies ahead. And in hope, we pray the words that Jesus would one day teach his first disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Throughout Lent, as you know, we have been hearing this hymn, Father Almighty Bless Us, an interpretation of the beloved Psalm 23, a prayer of trust in God's presence and provision in our lives. to a spirit of confession, not to beat ourselves up, but because we know we have fallen short of our goal to live as Jesus taught us. And we come because we know we need God's grace to encourage us, to free us from what has been that we might live and love as Jesus did. 
Let us pray. God of mercy and grace, we come to you today in need. We have tried to rely on our own ways, and it hasn't worked. We have tried to live by our vision for the world, and look where it has gotten us. We have held on to grudges. We have focused on vengeance, not reconciliation. We have hidden from your healing love. We have been afraid to ask for your renewal and grace. Forgive us. Grant us the peace only you can provide. Help us to live more fully and more faithfully as your children. With faith in Jesus, we pray. Amen. And now, in this time of silence, we bring our own personal concerns to God's forgiving grace. Hear the good news. God loves you. God knows you and claims you as God's very own, receiving you with love and grace, offering you forgiveness and newness of life. Thanks be to God. Scripture is a song of praise that for all those who strive to live surrounded by the shelter of God's love, that they might thrive, going from strength to strength with God as their guide. The psalm includes an introduction which says, according to the getith, which we know to be a musical instrument, and of the Korahites, one of the groups of singers in the world of ancient Israel. It also includes that instruction we've heard before, Selah, an invitation to take a long pause and consider what has been heard before proceeding. Reading Psalm 84, adapted from the New Revised Standard Version. To the leader, according to the Gittith, of the Korahites, a psalm. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Selah. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs, the early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. God bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. Our next hymn, Just As I Am, is probably familiar to many of us, a prayer that we can come to God as we are, trusting in God's incredible love to receive us, forgive us, and love us always. It uses the image of Jesus as the Lamb of God to represent the one who receives us fully and completely.
gospel about the kingdom of God, we hear more about being lost. Last week, we had a lost sheep and a lost coin. This week, a lost son in one of Jesus's most familiar parables. Reading from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, adapted from the New Revised Standard Version. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, Give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in wild living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his elder son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him? Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. 
May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the living of these scriptures. As we work our way through some of Jesus' parables about the kingdom of God, stories with images and ideas from our daily life that are designed to help our hearts and our minds and our spirits understand this enormous idea of the place of abundance for all. We've gotten bigger and bigger images. We started with mustard seeds and yeast, tiny bits of things that multiply and ripple out, changing everything around them. Then last week we had lost sheep and lost coins, always being searched for by the God who created us. This week we have probably the most familiar of the parables, the one called the prodigal son. I am fascinated by this story and by what happens that we don't hear about in the scriptures. So today I want us to use that holy imagination we've been developing and listen to what the prodigal son himself might have been thinking, not when he first returned home, but 20 years later, looking back on everything that happened. It all seems so long ago, that fateful day when I begged my father for my inheritance, and I suppose it has been a long time, 20 years now. You see, I'd always lived in my brother's shadow, he was the perfect child. He never disobeyed our parents. He never acted up. He was smart and good looking, and everybody loved my brother. And since he was the oldest, I knew from very early on that he would inherit the family farm, the house, the place we called home. I understood that, but my father was a good and just man and had promised me that I would have an inheritance too. But the years went on, and my brother took over more and more of the farming, and I started to get anxious. Well, maybe it was more like bored. There wasn't much for me to do. So eventually I worked up the nerve to ask my father for the inheritance that he had promised me. I was probably really pushy. I wanted what was coming to me, and I was not going to settle for no. And it turns out I didn't need to be that way. My father had no intention of saying no. He just looked at me, handed me my inheritance, and blessed me on my journey. I went immediately to my room and packed my belongings. I was free. I was rid of my perfect brother and of my boring family home. I could establish my own life, my own identity. I didn't need these people or this place or the religion I had been brought up with anymore. I would be independent. So the next morning I set out. I left early before anyone else was up. I didn't want to be bothered with long goodbyes. I traveled for a few days before I found a place where I thought I could settle. I took an apartment, and I furnished it with the best I could find. I was the life of the party. There were plenty of drinks and the finest food that money could buy. I spent my days talking in cafes and my nights celebrating. I didn't go anywhere near the synagogue. I didn't have time for that, those stale old traditions that my parents had instilled in me. No, I needed to live to have a good I had tons of friends. My house was always full of people. I never lacked companions for dinner. I suppose you can imagine what happened. The money was going out very quickly, and no money was coming in, and eventually my purse was empty. And then I realized I didn't have any friends. Not really. All those people who had been quite happy enjoying my generosity and eating my food and drinking my drinks, all of those people were gone when I didn't have any more to give. I found myself penniless and in danger of starvation. I wasn't sure what to do. So I went and I looked for work. It, it wasn't easy. 
There was a famine running through the country, and farms were closing, and hardly anyone had anything they could spare. And finally, in desperation, I found a farm where they said they could use me. They sent me out to the fields to feed the pigs. I couldn't believe how low I had sunk. If my parents had seen me there, surrounded by these animals, ritually unclean in our tradition, I know they would have been devastated. But it was all I could find. And still, I didn't have enough to eat. I, I would gladly have scrounged from what the pigs were eating, but there was nothing left. I slept out there in the fields, whatever the weather, with only my cloak to cover me, and it was horrible. For months, I worked there, continuously hungry, usually cold, always lonely. And then one day, while I was feeding the pigs, it occurred to me that even my father's slaves lived better than I did. They had clothes and food and shelter. Someone was looking after them, providing for them, caring about them. So that very day, I resolved to go back to my father's house. I figured I would fall at his feet and confess all of the stupid things I had done. I would admit that I had sinned against God and against my father and against my whole family, and I would beg for him to take me on as one of his slaves. That, that's all I wanted. I wasn't looking to reclaim my place in the family I knew I didn't deserve that, not, not after all I had done. I just wanted a place where I would have food and shelter and a little safety. So I set out. And I came to the crest of the hill that looks down on the house I grew up in, and I stopped to gather my strength. And I looked down, and I saw my father in front of the house tending his vegetable garden. He stood up, and that's when he saw me. And I was suddenly afraid of my father, of the anger I had imagined he would feel towards me. And he came running up the hill, and I fell at his feet, and I confessed everything, all of my sins and the foolishness of my life. I begged him to take me on as a slave. And I closed my eyes. like an eternity. But then, my father did the amazing. He put his hand on my head, and he repeated the blessing he had said all that time before when he gave me my inheritance. He lifted up my head, and he took my hand, and he hugged me like I had never been hugged before. He called to the slave standing nearby and asked for a robe to be brought, the best one in the house, and a ring. And my father ordered that a calf be cooked in my honor. He put the robe on me, the richest fabric I had ever seen, the clothes I had longed for. And he slipped that ring on my finger, the symbol of our family line. And we went into the house, and we ate this lavish feast, everything that I had turned my back on had been restored to me. But my brother was, as you might imagine, more than a little upset at my father's generosity with me. He figured that I didn't deserve anything because I had been out squandering my inheritance. He said that for all the time I was away, he had worked devotedly for our father, and he had never had such a celebration. Our father spent a while persuading him to come inside, and eventually he did, but he still wasn't happy. He was at the feast, but he kept to himself, standing near the wall, and he left as soon as he could. For a while, more than a year, things between my brother and I were cool at best. He was angry. I understood. I didn't deserve what our father did for me. I didn't deserve my place back in the community. I deserved to be yelled at, 
to be scorned and shamed and rejected. But our Father responded not with hatred, but with compassion. It took a lot of time, but eventually, my brother and I both came to understand what our Father was doing, to see that unconditional love isn't about getting what we deserve, it's about getting what we need. That was all 20 years ago. My brother and I now share the responsibility for our family farm. We married lovely women from the village and we were raising our children together. We go to the synagogue every morning for prayers and the entire family goes on the Sabbath to hear the rabbis teach. A few weeks ago, the discussion at the synagogue was about grace, the love that God shows to the faithful. Some people were arguing that grace is limited, that that God only has so much to give out and that eventually, if you do things wrong enough, often enough, God will stop loving you, stop giving you grace. I, I've never been one for speaking up in public places, but I, I just couldn't hold my tongue that day. I stood up and I said, I knew there were no limits on God's love, no limits on the grace that God showers on us. I said that there was nothing Nothing we could do or not do or say or not say that would ever stop God from loving us. With, with tears in my eyes, remembering what my father had done for me and looking at my brother, I said I was sure of this because I had experienced it in my life, that I had been restored, blessed with God's unending love because of my father's generous spirit. I'll say it again. There is nothing we can do or not do, say or not say, that will ever stop God from loving us. I pray it might give you the courage to trust in God, the God who will receive you whatever you've done or not done in the past, that it might give you the courage to know you always have a place at God's table reserved just for you, no matter how far you may have wandered. And that it might give you the courage to share that kind of grace and generosity with everyone you meet. Amen. And now, having shared in worship together, let us pray in thanksgiving for all God's blessings in our lives. God of all time, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together in person and in spirit. We thank you for the chance to bring you our gifts our time, and our lives. As we live into this week, help us carry your love and grace with us in all we do. Help us to see the world through your eyes. Help us to love others as you love us. Guide us that we might be a part of rebuilding and restoring this world that you love so very much. In gratitude and courage we pray. Amen. Our last hymn, God Be With You, is a familiar one for many of us, and it prays for God's presence in our lives while we are separate from one another.
and my friends receive this benediction. In this holy season of Lent, may you find rest for your soul, encouragement for your heart, and nurture for your mind. And may the grace of God, the love of Jesus, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen.